Very brief, because I know, uh, you know it's a Thursday morning, it's gnarly outside, we, our room practically came in last night, but we're here! So we're going to keep it tight this morning, you have coffee, you're ready to talk about data in a way that makes sense in terms of how it's applying to your life, to your work, to your neighborhood, more importantly. So Juliana is all about making data accessible, and she is at the new center at NYU for data science, so they have a new degree in data science itself. And what's interesting that she told me is that it's mostly for non-computer science students, so people who have math backgrounds or all different kinds of backgrounds. So she's going to go into some of that um, as well. And their focus is on big data management. So how do we take all of the information that we're getting from absolutely everywhere and make sense of it, draw conclusions, make hopefully our cities better places to live? Um, how do we, I want to ask her later when we get to the Q&A, how do we connect convince um, our city governments that it is their responsibility to hand over all that data and make it open to all of us. And then also, I want to ask, um, what, what responsibility do corporations have to make the data available? But first, she's going to talk about the work that she's doing uh, in terms of helping us all understand that data. So she's going to make a presentation about 20 minutes, and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. So jot them down if you don't think they're looking good. Well, thank, you, thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you for coming. Um, my daughter is going to get a great kick out of that. She's 10. Mm -hmm. And she says, Mommy, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to give a talk because I'm going to dick off the mom. <laughs> and she had a great laugh. And she immediately Instagrammed or whatever that my mom is a geek. Uh, what a realization, right? So uh, as Manush mentioned, I'm actually part, NYU has um, many new efforts and initiatives all around data. So she talked about data, the data finance uh, center for data science. But there's also the Center for Urban Science and Progress, uh, which is really trying to make New York City a living, uh, it's gonna be a living lab for New York City. And it's gonna be storing all data from New York City agencies, right? So we're having a lot of fun there. And that's also one of, I moved to New York um, two and a half years ago. And you know, as soon as I moved here, and all the stuff started at NYU, I got fascinated because I've always loved to work with data, <coughs> but urban data is so much cooler because uh, you know, I worked with physicists, biologists before, and just understanding their science is so complicated. But when you talk about city data, we live it, right? So you can talk to the most you know, renowned economists or social scientists and you actually get it, right? So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what we have been doing just to give you an idea. Um, but first, let me introduce, uh, we are relatively new group at the School of Engineering at NYU that we're called GIGA, Visualization and Analysis. We have four faculty members, uh, senior personnel, uh, research staff, uh, PhD students, and the group has a good mix of uh, expertise in different aspects of uh, dealing with data, from data management, databases, storage, and vaccine, to uh, visualization, geometric computing, provenance, and, and web mining. Right? So our group actually works end to end, from the data to the insight, and addresses a lot of the problems in, the, in this pipeline. And I'm gonna tell you about one of the projects that illustrates some of this, right? So what I find very interesting about working in this area is because it's very relevant, right? So if you look today, 50% of the world's population already lives in cities. And by 2050, the number is gonna go to 70%. In North America, we are, all, we are already 80% of people in cities, right? Uh, so cities are really the lost eye of uh, economic development and will continue to be the places where innovations occur. But they are also the source of lots and lots of challenges when it comes to transportation, resource uh, consumption, as well as housing affordability, right? So this is where I think that you know, having data, big data analysis, visualization, exploration can actually help, right? Because one way of uh, th thinking of a city is that it's like a complex computer program that has different components, right? And this program, its behavior is actually governed by these components, which are uh, an urgent point, right? Which is people, right? Uh, you know, how they relate, how they, in a, in a certain a social way, the environment, pollution, noise, weather, right, and the infrastructure, which includes the physical infrastructure as well as the policies, right? What is very interesting is the fact that these different components actually generate a huge, a massive volume of an urban data exhaust, 
right? And although we do not have the actual specification of the CD program, those data at Ross can actually give us a lot of insight into the rules that actually regulate how the city operates, right? And by analyzing these data, we actually have a great opportunity to improve cities as well as the lives of their citizens, right? So there are a number of success stories. I chose two, just in a, in a random way, just to illustrate how looking at the data can actually be beneficial. So one example is this uh, one buzz away uh, application. I'm not sure if you guys heard of it. It was developed by the University of Washington. And it uses historical and real-time bug information to do real-time prediction. So people know exactly when their bug is going to arrive. So this actually has greatly improved you, uh, people, citizen satisfactions in terms of uh, you know, public transit. Right? So it's a very good example. And they even show that uh, people are now walking more because they know when the bug is going to come. So this is going to have implicit uh, health benefits to the population. Another example you guys must be familiar with happened during the Bloomberg administration where Mike Flower was tasked uh, to put together a number of different data sources from different city agencies. And one big success that they had was that by combining this information and analyzing the information, they were able to more efficiently attack the problem of uh, illegal conversions, okay? So by looking at the data, they were able to rank and prioritize certain inspections, and their hit rate went from 13% to 70%, right? And it is good not just for the city, making the city more efficient, but it makes the city safer for us, right? Because you avoid the illegal conversions, right? But now let's take a step back. Uh, we've all heard, we're sick of hearing about big data. Big data is everywhere, right? Uh, but you know, if you're really a little bit cynical, big data is not new. Big data has been around for a long, long time in many different domains. If you look financial transactions, AT&T, AT&T had you know, a billion call detail records 20 years ago. They MLB, how much data does MLB have, you know? So this is not new. Astronomers, they have pictures of the whole sky. This is really not new, right? So what I claim is new is the fact that data is no longer silent. It's been democratized. Now there's lots of data available to everybody. So we talked talk about you know, governments making their data available, but I think there is already a big push. Maybe they're not, it's not perfect yet, but you see, you know, the American government, you see different cities in the United States and North America, you see governments in different countries, India, uh, England, Brazil, you have all these you know, social data now that is available that we can actually use. Uh, and this actually has led to a much bigger number of data enthusiasts. So these people that are analyzing data and leveraging data are no longer just inside companies where there's, you know, amazing infrastructure and, you know, the size of data. Now each of us can be a data analyst, right? We can grab data. Uh, and the, uh, the last factor that really makes the perfect storm is that not only have access to data, <coughs> but we have very easy access to computing power, right? So buying equipment nowadays is extremely cheap. I mean, these are two examples of equipment that I bought maybe a year ago, so these prices probably should be lower now. So a server with 64 cores and half a, a terabyte of RAM, only 11K, right? <coughs> Big cluster, 1004, 150K. I mean, five years ago, 10 years ago, this would be like millions of dollars, right? And if you don't have money to put that, uh, to, to pay for that, you can just pay as you go with Amazon to buy 10 cents an hour or something like that, right? So you have data, you have people, and you have the machine. So it's perfect. So everybody now can actually uh, play with, uh, with data, right? Uh, but then another mistake that I think people often make when they talk about big data is that they emphasize the size. And to me, uh, when you think this is not the biggest problem, because basically if you want to do batch analysis of data, people have solved this problem, right? There's high performance computing, there's cloud, there's lots of research, and products in distributed systems, parallel databases, that can handle with that, that. If the data grows, you add more nodes. That's the beauty of the cloud and elasticity, right? To me, the biggest problem is scalability for people. Because to analyze data and draw insights, you need people. Right? Even though there are all these people doing deep learning, saying that the machines are going to be learning by themselves, that's the yes. It's not going to happen. You need people in the loop, right? And data, exploring data is very hard because the path from data to knowledge is very tortuous. You need to play with different algorithms. There are different techniques you have to use. Data mining, machine learning, maybe geometry processing. You have different interaction modes and so on, right? And this is hard regardless of whether the data is big or small. 
And I claim that even for small data, we haven't addressed this problem properly. And big data simply adds uh, complexity to it, right? So the vision that we have for our research program is that <coughs> we'd like to democratize big data for uh, uh, cities, right? So the idea is that we'd like information technology and urban government and management to really be something that everybody, all the citizens can engage, right? So our goal, our long-term goal is to empower a wide range of users to be able to leverage this data. And the fact that you know, data intensive research and practice should be widely used, used and adopted by not only researchers and policy makers, but also uh, the urban residents. And the big challenge I see to make this vision a reality is that we, to, for that to become a reality, we need to significantly uh, improve the tools that we have. So these tools need to be more automated, more usable, uh, and more interactive, right? So this is what we, you know, we're, we're aiming to do uh, in terms of uh, a book for our whole research program. And there's a number of problems that we work on, information integration, data analysis, visualization, visual analytics, and data and governance management. And I'm gonna use an example that illustrates some of the uh, 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 work that we have been doing in the middle part, data analysis, visualization, and data Okay, so about uh, maybe a little bit over a year ago, we got data from the Taxi and Limousine Commission uh, about the taxi trips in New York, right? Uh, and here I show a plot that shows the number of trips, how it varies over the year every day for 2011 and 2012, right? So you see very clearly the beat of the city, right? So you see January 1st, nobody takes cabs. You see Christmas. You see Thanksgiving, you see Sandy, you see Irene, right? And you also see that the city, I mean, from year to year, it's about the same. I mean, every year, the number of cabs, the number of cab trips that you have is the same. So it's, it's amazing how taxis are actually a great sensor for uh, city life, right? And this is like looking at this at, at, at the macro level. But using this data, you can ask me questions that go from uh, you know, things that are relevant for transportation, like what is the average trip time from Midtown to the airport during weekdays, uh, how was the activity in Midtown affected uh, during the presidential visit, to more economic, uh, economic um, relevant questions, like what are the popular places in New York City, or nice spots, or more social uh, uh, relevant questions, like which neighborhoods are underserved by taxis, right? And you can look at the data at the macro level, or also at a very low level, uh, where you can actually see the, the actual taxi trip. So here I have blue pickups, so orange drop-offs, right? And we're looking at four different hours on a Sunday, May 1st, I think 2012. And you see some interesting pattern, right? All the cabs all around. Then the cabs disappear on Sixth Avenue, disappear, and then they come back, right? And what was this? The city, uh, uh, the five borough by tour, right? So the data really reflects what's happening in the city, right? So how do people go about analyzing this kind of uh, data? So the common practice for, it's not just urban, but data analysis in general, is that you get domain experts uh, or policy makers, they come up with a, a number of hypotheses and questions. And then you get an IT person or a data science, which is a, a more uh, sexy name these days. Uh, they will select the appropriate data slices, will do the plotting, use R, using different kinds of tools, come up with you know results, and they show to the, right? And there are a number of problems with this current uh, uh, um, uh, approach. First of all is that you know, the analysis are most confirmatory. You start with hypotheses, right? So you're just improving or disproving. But the data could actually show you lots of things that you don't know if you actually explore it. So I'm going to give you a few examples of that, right? Because it's very, very complex, uh, you know, spatial, temporal, the queries, each query, each question that you ask can be extremely expensive. It can take minutes to hours to days in order to answer it, right? And the analysis are also very complex because you're looking at longitudinal data. So you may have to compare many, many, very large number of different time slices. And then if you look at the infrastructure that we have, you know, although we have this great big data infrastructure, people are still using Excel, GIS systems, uh, some statistical packages. And these things are not scalable, right? You cannot load, say, a, a, a half a billion taxi trips in this kind of tools that just cannot handle that. And I think one of the big problems here is the fact that uh, the models of early actually forces, uh, uh, um, leaves the domain expert out really of the data analysis process. Because you always have this uh, you know, person in the middle 
right? So the domain expert is not able to explore his or her data. He, he or she has to do that through this IT expert, who is the one that is able to use these complex tools, right? Okay, so let's look at the cab data really quickly. Uh, we have uh, over 13,000 cabs in New York. Uh, they make, on average, 500,000 trips a day. And uh, we initially obtained uh, three years of data, which is about 520 million trips total, right? And the data, by the way, is gonna get much larger because the Taxi and Limousine Commission is gonna start tracking data, data for over 100,000 vehicles. And right now, they only have the starting endpoints of the trip, but they're gonna now get full the full GPS trail, right? And that's gonna add, for each year of data, about two terabytes, right? So this data is really gonna explode, right? But even the smallish data, for many people, when you say, oh, five, uh, half a billion trips, that's not that much, that's not big data, right? Even for this data that is not so big, if you talk to experts that have had this data, they have never been able to explore the whole data set, right? They do little time slices here and there, and that's what they, they have played with, right? So we set out a goal to design a user interface that would allow these domain experts to interactively explore these data. And uh, the first thing we had to do is the data preparation. How do you store your data? So we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We tried existing tools. We tried uh, open source tools. We tried um, commercial databases. And what we found is that not only they have uh, you know, huge overhead in terms of storage space, but they're very slow. Just to build the indices, uh, they can take anywhere between 700 and 3,000 minutes. We thought this was a bug, but we waited and then ended up thinking, can you imagine like, waiting 3,000 minutes to finish indexing just one year of data? It's really not you know, uh, uh, practical. But then the worst part is that for even for small queries, the times were like between three and eight seconds, and this is really not interactive. And when you get some more complex queries, it would take anywhere between 20 and 80 seconds, right? So this is really not acceptable. So as good computer scientists, we sat down and we did our own database. We created a new kind of indexing, a spatial temporal indexing, using an out-of-core KD3. And now we have much lower uh, um, space overhead building indices is much cheaper, and now we have second or sub-second response times for these complex queries, right? So now we're able to really do uh, uh, interactive uh, exploration. And then, of course, we went ahead and did some more. We actually used GPUs uh, to do yet another indexing, and that brought the times down even farther. <coughs> and it's funny that you can compare with a commercial database, which I'm not allowed to tell you which one it is, right? It's taken anywhere between a 28 and a 136 seconds where you know, all our queries are under a second, right? Okay, so, but then just being fast is not sufficient because we want end users that are not computer scientists to actually be able to explore their data, right? So we cannot expect people to write even something like SQL, which is a declarative language, but it does require training. So what we did is we uh, developed, designed this visual uh, query language that users can create their queries by, you know, using the interface, selecting areas, and so on, right? Uh, so you visually create your query, and we automatically generate the uh, uh, SQL that will uh, grab the data that you're asking for, right? So another interesting feature uh, that we introduced with this tool was the fact that uh, you're able to do your data selection, select your slices, and do the analytics in the same environment. Because usually it's the case that you get your slice, move to another tool, and do the analysis in another tool, right? So by combining the two in the same environment, what we can do is that uh, you can do your analysis without losing the spatial context, right? And you can move things around and you can interactively explore this in a much more uh, uh, natural way, right? And another thing that we have, uh, and, you know, if you're gonna notice, and I'm gonna show a little video shortly, right? And that you know, each different selection here is a different query. And when you do your analytics, you can actually identify your query, what is selected by the column, right? So uh, there's gonna be examples that can make this really cool. And the other thing is because we're dealing with so many uh, trips, some of these queries have you know, millions of different results, we ended up having to develop a whole new uh, map rendering infrastructure to be able to uh, 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 display a large number of objects on the map, right? So here's, uh, it should start. So this is what the tool looks like. Did it start or not? No. Maybe I need to click on my spacebar.
the two in, uh, in action. Uh, so essentially, you can uh, you know, select the time and you can step through time uh, to see how the behavior of the taxes change. I mean, again, blue is a pick up, red is drop off, right? So you can do different types of selection. You can do a specific day, a specific time period, or you can say, now find me all Mondays between 0 and 1 a.m. So you have all this ability to do different kinds of selections. So, so you can see that all of these is done in real time, right? So you're doing the selections and the queries are gonna be posed to, you know, over our index. And you can have region queries as well as directional queries. So here's, I'm looking for all the taxi trips from the meatpacking district to uh, you know, the Murray Hill area, right? So, and as you do that, you can see that, um, uh, you know, the analytics pop up here, right? Uh, you know, I was hoping to be able to control the speed of these things. So here's what, what I'm showing you is the, the, the how to deal with a large number of answers. So you can see that there are just too many. So we did a lot of work on a level of detail uh, and you know, using heat maps combined with that in order to handle the uh, large number of uh, um, query results. And you can do selections at different levels. You can do free selection as you've seen before, but you can select, select neighborhoods. You can look at uh, uh, summaries for particular indicators for the individual neighborhoods. Um, and uh, the other thing that you can do is, uh, so you can try to analyze the, the movement patterns between different neighborhoods. So for example, from the West Village to the Upper uh, East Side. Um, and you can see the, the actually the, the uh, trajectories of the wow. cab uh, <laughs> from one place to another, right? Um, and I think there's another, just one more thing that I cannot control it, sorry. So we're gonna have to wait. Um, and another thing that we do, because uh, one of the most important operations is actually to be able to compare different slices, data slices. So the tool allows you to have multiple views and synchronize them. So in this case, what we're looking is um, for uh, patterns uh, of nightlife. So we're looking Saturday to Sunday and Monday to Tuesday, right? And you can actually see that these are the two places to be between uh, 10 p.m. and 2 a.m., right? So even on Mondays, people actually are out. And you can get a bunch of uh, 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 summaries and so on, and maybe I can, before I get picked up for two years. <laughs> study different aspects of the city. As I said, you know, you can look at mobility with these uh, 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 directional queries. You know, for example, here what you're showing is uh, trips from uh, uh, downtown to the different airports and how they differ on, from a Sunday to a Monday, right? So, you know, the picture clearly shows that the right here is uh, JFK, so it's always worse to go to JFK, right? But then if you go on a Monday uh, between like and 6 p.m., then you can get, you know, up to two hours uh, the trip, right? So you can do this kind of analysis. You can also compare different neighborhoods. Uh, so just, you know, the tax density in the different neighborhoods. And there are some interesting patterns that we can see here. So you can see that Midtown, you know, is very busy always, except in the weekends, Greenwich Village, which is the, uh, of the three villages, right, get to be hotter, right? So that's where everybody is during the weekends. Uh, and you can also see some interesting patterns. If you look at here, Harlem and East Harlem is a little blue line, right? If you want to cab there, you're out of luck because it's really underserved. Um, you can also study the effect of uh, different events. So here's what happened during Sandy. This is the taxi view of the of Sandy, the Hurricane Sandy. This is the day before the hurricane. Then the CDO goes blank, and life starts to get back to normal north. And we only see the light on Saturday, right? Uh, and then, again, it's made very easy by just this point and click and this visual selection. And you can do that interactively as you saw in the video. Right? So where are we right now? So we demoed this tool to folks at the Department of Transportation and uh, TLC. And they are currently adopted. Uh, they, they have adopted the prototype. And essentially, after the meeting, this is what they said. <laughs> we are truly blown away, right? They could never imagine that those queries that took them weeks to actually execute could be done interactively using a tool like this. Um, we, although we built the infrastructure for taxis, the system is actually general and we've used it for 
John aligned different kinds of data, the city bike data, energy consumption, so this is an attack of energy consumption. So this shows the different buildings and how much energy they consume. So you can get a good idea of who are the hoggers and who are the more how are you getting, hmm? where are you getting that data? Uh, so this data is actually something internally at GASP that was obtained. This is not open data. Um, uh, Another work that I'm doing with folks at the NYU Furman Center is trying to understand who owns New York City. We have this uh, ownership study. So we use the tool also to figure out who owns, who are the biggest owners of the different parts of the, the city. Okay. Uh, and there are a bunch of things that we're still doing. We're trying to improve the scalability of the, city, the, the, the tool even more by leveraging multi-core uh, machines. Everybody now has a, a parallel machine in their laptops. So we are developing infrastructure to leverage that to make these uh, explorations even uh, faster. Okay. Uh, we also built a prototype uh, Find a Cab app by using the historical data. So you're standing at a corner in New York. What is, where should I go to get a taxi at this day, at this time? And we're hoping to make this available sometime soon on your app store. Um, uh, another new uh, piece of work that we're doing is even though with a tool like TaxiBiz, it's easy for people to explore data, there are still too many time slices, right? You know, if you try to break the city in different uh, uh, pieces and you know, look at different time periods, it's just too much, right? So we have started to develop techniques to try and automatically identify potentially interesting events, right? So we uh, did some work where we used uh, computational topology to find uh, these events. Uh, so essentially you do some computation over the data, think about this as like some complex statistics, and then we can show this to the user, and the user can actually figure out, okay, so I want to see, you know, this point is very different from the other, so what does that correspond to? And that is what the tool shows, and this is the pi for a y -core. So with this automated technique, you can actually identify these events in a more automated way, and that can provide users like an event-guided event way of exploring their data. Right. Another area that we're looking for is uh, how can you actually help the cause of a particular event or uh, uh, effect that you see in your data, right? Because when I showed you this plot, you know, January 1st, you expect, you expect sin, you expect Irene, you remember those things. But what happened here, right? April, why there's so few taxes on the street at uh, uh, end of March, beginning of, beginning of April of uh, 2011? I went to Google to find out, and what happened was, Gas prices went way up, so the cabs just uh, didn't go on the streets because they would lose money otherwise. So uh, I think it's really important, uh, and basically then that raises the question, if you're analyzing the data, so how do gas prices actually affect uh, taxi availability, right? And there's something that can influence, for example, policy and uh, uh, taxi fare structures, right? But to do this kind of thing and really explore and understand your data, you, you, you need to integrate dif different data sources. Right? So this is an area that we work on, like say information integration, that's something that uh, uh, um, we're exploring right now in terms of uh, how do you do exploration, not just of one data set, but bringing things as you discover, right? So this online, real-time data integration. All right, to close, and I didn't get kicked out, but am I too far <laughs> over? No, yeah. okay. uh, so uh, I think that, uh, you some points that I'd like to make is the fact that you know data exploration is hard period, it doesn't matter if the data is big or small, and for both cases you actually need tools that are easy to use, that the domain expert, the person that knows the domain, that knows the right question, that knows the context can actually use, right? And these tools need to be easy to use and they need to be interactive. I mean, the experience that I have had with um, uh, working not just with uh, social science, but with scientists uh, in, in general, is that the moment that they have a tool in their head, they can make progress so much faster, right? And here I'm talking about research, but the same applies to industry. You know, analysts in industry, they're doing the same kind of process over and over again, right? So I think that the big challenge that we have right now is really how we develop these tools that are, you know, help or support this exploratory process. Another thing that is very important is that visualization is, uh, you know, crucial if you want to make sense out of data. Right? Because what is nice about visualization is that it frees up your cognitive load. So if you see something, you can immediately see that. You don't have to think too hard. And you can save your you know, uh, higher level cognitive ability to higher level tasks. Right? You know, really <coughs> reasoning about what you see as opposed to spending two hours looking at a plot to figure out what just the plot says. Right? 
Uh, and uh, you know, I think that the, this push to uh, have open data uh, is really a great opportunity for us to better understand the city, right? And also to engage everybody. Because I think that uh, even uh, so far, yeah, lots of people have used this data, but it's always, you know, maybe scientists, maybe policy makers, maybe people at companies, right? But I think it's really important to engage uh, the citizens to be involved in this process so that they can be heard, right? And we can actually have, and with data, we can uh, have evidence to make our point to government and try to make changes, affect changes. Uh, and, uh, you know, finally to close is that, you know, I think that I see many, many challenges for computer science and uh, in terms of uh, making this vision a reality. Uh, but most of the projects that uh, I've worked on actually underscore the importance of collaboration across different areas, right? Uh, we see nowadays that, you know, data scientists is the sexiest uh, job. Everybody wants to be a data scientist. But I would claim that there's no such a person. Or maybe there are maybe one, two, or three in the world, right? Because one data scientist, to build one data science, you need at least three different people. Right? You have somebody to understand the data menu, how to manipulate the data, prepare the data, put the data in the database. You then need somebody that is really good, say, at modeling, data mining, or machine learning. And you need somebody that is really good at visualization, at creating visual representations, right? It's very hard to find one person that is actually not, has this deep knowledge on, uh, in all of these uh, different areas. And that is what we've been doing in our group, and we actually have been very successful so far. So with that, I close. Thank you so much. We'll just take a few questions. Anybody want to go first? Okay, I have a question, which is uh, there's this concern, I know certainly as journalists, that there are some people in our city that just don't generate data. People who, you know, lower socioeconomic backgrounds who they take the subway, they wouldn't be taking taxis, or they don't carry phones or use apps that are following them around. How do you make sure that everyone is represented with? in terms of generating data. I mean, there was this uh, the study that was looking at potholes. You know, where are the most potholes in this city? And, um, well, all the potholes were in the richest neighborhoods. Well, guess why? Because they, the, they were, well, they, it was the phones that were tracking when they went over bumps. Oh, okay. So it was only richer people who had the phone that had installed the app and knew about it to track the bumps. So how do we make it sort of more equitable? So, uh, you know, I think that the city is already doing some of that. Um, there's bus data coming up. I think it's uh, it's starting to be available, so you're gonna have we have MTA data. Yeah. Uh, although our system is not very good for tracking because we don't know where we only know where people get in. We don't know where they get out, right? Uh -huh. But there's some data uh, about that too, and I think there are opportunities if you get three one one data, anybody can report, right? Um, but this is a good question. I recently did a study using all the open data sets for the cities in um, North America. And that was a question that I had. Is, uh, is there a correlation in terms of the density of data available for a zip code and the socioeconomic um, uh, uh, characteristics of that zip code? And uh, at least for New York, I can, I can actually grab the, 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 the image. I didn't see a direct correlation. No? No. Right, so there's a, but I didn't do like a deep study of uh, what it is. If I did just did a heat map, yeah, and it's not the case that the less, the, the most advantaged areas were lighter. They were not, right? But it also depends on the data sets that we're looking at. So I think that this is something that deserves a deeper study. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. You said you did have access to the three one one data. So we do have access okay. to the three one one data. So the three one one data is available at the NYC Open Data website. Great. Thing. Do you have any anecdotes about how policy got affected from big data? Something like you know more left turn barring or narrowing the streets or changing the lines. Do you have any anecdotes? About so that? there are so the the, the Furman Center at the NYU is the Furman Center for Real Estate and Policy. Uh, they for many years they have been doing urban data analysis, and there are some examples. One of them was um, they are very big on subsidi on um, low income housing, right? So they have studies which show the importance of the of availability of low-income housing throughout the city, right? Uh, and how it benefits the different neighborhoods. And based on their study, the city actually changed their investment uh, policy, right? So 
So the other thing that they did was a study where they looked at the neighborhoods where they had uh, at the, the big crisis and mortgage and uh, all the um, uh, people, people losing their houses the and so on, okay. right? So they immediately saw a spike in crime in those areas where the houses were being unoccupied and so on, right? And because of that, the city increased the policing in those areas, right? So th there are, uh, uh, you know, and if you look at Bloomberg, I think he was amazing because I think he, he really uh, 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 enforced this uh, uh, evidence-based um, decision-making in New York City. So, I mean, talking to folks at the city agencies, they do a bunch of studies. You know, all of the decisions that they make about what the buses do or the subways, if you talk to the analysts, they actually build models and they do a bunch of these studies before they actually make the decision. Go ahead. So uh, I'm struck by the point where you uh, identified scalability, the constraint to scalability is a certain kind of person or a certain kind of role. It's not necessarily the technology, it's that, I, if I misunderstood you, correct me please, but I thought you were saying that there is a, there's a need for people who can make sense that by having someone, or maybe it's a combination of a team that is a domain expert mm -hmm. plus a technologist who understands the data science plus the access to the data. Mm -hmm. What in your mind, if you could talk a little bit about what constrains you from going further with this or applying it more broadly? And what are you doing to overcome those constraints? Because I think it seems that there are lots of places where we can use these tools, mm -hmm. we can use this capability, but they are not commodities, they're not readily available to us to attack problems. Right. So, so scaling what you can do becomes very important to the rest of us. Right, so so my group has worked on this for a number of years. So I think that one of the challenges is that um, uh, different problems, so to, the, the, the thing is that scaling usability is tough. And as you do that, um, it becomes very, it starts to become specific and more specific, right? So I've developed an open source tool called these trails. Uh, it's very general, it can be used for anything, right? But it's not very easy to use, okay? But then, you know, building on top of that, we ended up building specializations and specializations for particular areas. So that we specialize these trails for climate data analysis. But now it's a climate data analysis tool, and then a climate data, anal data analyst can actually use it, right? So when we work at ornithologists, we build something called BirdVis, that only works for uh, uh, um, birds, right? But what we're, we've tried to do, and the lesson we learned is that there's a whole set of infrastructure that you can build that can be customized, right? So with this, and the examples that I showed, what we hope is that we have the infrastructure now for efficient exploration of spatial temporal data, right? And uh, Big work now is now how do you actually customize that for different domains, right? Because different domains are going to require different uh, analysis, different operations, and so on, right? So I think that, yes, it's, that is a challenging problem. And I think for different um, uh, questions or kinds of analysis, the answer is going to be different. So just to make sure I understand, you're saying both the technology infrastructure, a toolkit that you've been developing over mm -hmm. years, but another important piece of that is people who know how to use it to take it to the last mile. Right, so so you, you're gonna need the IT or the CS expert up to the customization before a domain expert can use the tool directly. I mean, I would just add with a couple examples. For example, uh, WNYC has a data visualization team now and they are able to, one that went very big was, um, where could the Malaysia flight have landed and they built an interactive map that listed the six, over 600 runways that it could potentially have reached with the amount of fuel that was left. So I think you're seeing more of these smaller teams being built to make applications and make it usable for the rest of us. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I would love to mention is um, Datakind is a nonprofit that uses, that reaches out to data scientists at various corporations as volunteers and then they get together and work with other smaller nonprofits who could use their expertise to build data visualization. So one example they showed me um, the other day was they took a bunch of agency um, information from Washington, D.C. and built um, child welfare, essentially, maps of different neighborhoods in Washington, D.C. and mm -hmm. various different agencies and nonprofits now have access to that. 
Um, so there seem to be many more, for the people that can't afford to have their own teams, hopefully there will be, this will be seen more as sort of a public good and a, yeah. a nonprofit sort of. But all of that is, is enabled by underlying infrastructure, right? So there's a system called D3 that was developed by Jeff Hirsch from uh, Stanford, who is now in uh, Washington, right? So a lot of that, yes, now these people can do that, but they can do that because there is D3, because there is, you know, uh, the browser that can run these things and so on. So for, so for each of these different things, you need the infrastructure, you need to build like these layers that enable the, you know. Would you guys be commercializing or open sourcing any part of your platform? I hope so, yes. Uh, any uh, open source. Do you feel very strongly about that, the open source aspect yeah, of it? Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, mo most of the work that we do is actually funded by the government. Uh -huh. I'm paying for my tax. You know, <laughs> you're to be able to use it. Yeah. I guess I just have one, we only have time for one more question. Uh, one yeah, just um, um, So, you know, I've heard uh, some people say that they just have to change the way science is done. You know, we used to look at the past and have a hypothesis and then go out and look for data that would either confirm or deny. Now we can get the data and let the computers, you know, determine whether there are patterns, right? Um, is, is that right? Is that the right way to think about that? So, so people have called this the fourth paradigm, right? Where it's now it's science is data intensive. Before, you know, it took a long time for people to observe and uh, you know, write down the data that they saw and then they came up with theories and so on, right? And now we have to do that from the you know, uh, oceans of data that uh, we actually obtain, right? So this has really changed science. And uh, we, I don't know if people have measured that in any quantitative way, but if you, if you see, I mean, this is uh, really crossing. It started to be like physics, maybe biology, but now social sciences, you know, the, the amount of data that people are using is great. And one good example that I like to use is, um, I do, do you guys know about Google Scholar? It's a place where they have, uh, you know, it's a search engine for papers, for scientific papers. And I, I, every once in a while I do a Google search for Twitter and Facebook, and I've seen an order of magnitude increase in the number of papers. Now it's millions of papers that mention Facebook or Twitter, which means that this actually has, I mean, just the availability of that data and the analysis actually has led to lots of, you know, a huge number of, uh, you know, scientific output. Right? And you had another question? Um, yes, actually, I did have another question, which is, uh, so what the data that you're looking at with taxis is publicly available, it's the EOT, right? Oh, uh, not really. No? Right? So it's not available on the NYC open data, uh -huh. right? This one we have to uh, do a FOIL, okay. which is a request to the TLC for them to give us the data, right? Okay. The Freedom, Freedom yeah. of Information Act. So, you know, any, any of us can get any government data by, you know, so submitting my, a FOIL. My yeah. question is though, as we see more and more sort of startups disrupt um, mm -hmm. public spaces, like Airbnb in the hotel industry, I'm thinking Uber, Lyft, and taxis, how is that going to affect how you are able to get the data in order do this because we're seeing private companies who don't play by the same rules for better or worse mm -hmm. and that is that they don't share their own data and they don't share yeah yeah you know the thing about sharing data is, is a very touchy issue because some companies are going to say you know data is uh, essentially is their it's their IP right if their IP is that what they make mon money out of so how are you going to argue uh, against that right and even for the government I also see issues, maybe not with the cap data so much, but there are some data sets that you can see as being sensitive, like what we talked about the NYPD, right? So there are some data that can be very sensitive, and yes, it's good to have transparency, but at the same ta time, it can be dangerous to that, that data out there. So I mean, I think there is a big tension. Uh, I don't have uh, an answer for that. I do see that there is a big uh, advantage of having open data. I mean look at all the stuff that is happening just because we have these uh, data available. And unfortunately, there's no, I mean, if you look at computer science technique security, privacy, you cannot take any guarantees. As soon as you put data out, you know, it, it's fair game. And because there's so much other data, even if you try to, you know, de-identify a data set, you can find, you know, other data sources that if you put them together, you're going to be able to de-identify them, right? So I think we really need to work, I mean, government and on policy how people actually use their data. Because it's the same thing with, I don't know, with cars. 
Are we not gonna let people drive cars because sometimes people, you know, cause accidents, right? So I, I, I see it as the, the well, same way. Google to take care of that. <laughs> this is great. We have to leave it there. I know you have to get to your busy days. Thank you Thank so you much so for much. coming, Juliana. <laughs> did, uh, did, did Juliana learn, earn her geek of the month? Yes. 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 Super um, geeky. Oh, and those of you who are able to stay, I believe, uh, yep, yep. Take for a tour. Yeah. <laughs>